Hi, everybody who's here already. Just uh, sit tight for a few minutes. We're going to let a few more people join, and then we'll begin our discussion. Okay, I think we'll get started. Hi, everybody. I am Patrick Mullane. I'm here with Christina de la Sierva uh, talking about ways, uh, creative ways to advance your career. Um, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to introduce Christina, and then Christina is going to in, uh, introduce me, and then Christina is going to ask me some questions, and we'll start a conversation. Uh, so I am the executive director of HBS Online and uh, HBS Executive Education, so all the non-degree programs at Harvard. I just took that out of your introduction now, Christina. You don't have to even say that. No. Um, Christina has been with HBS Online for eight years, and she's a senior director of marketing and product management. Uh, she went to college at Holy Cross, which for those who don't know is here in Massachusetts, in central Massachusetts and then started a financial services career at Morgan Stanley, uh, then got her MBA from here at Harvard Business School, uh, many years after me, I think, um, and then uh, changed her career into marketing. Uh, prior to HBS Online, uh, she had had roles in advertising and marketing and brand management at Nike, Converse, Groton Seafood, and Arnold Worldwide. And most importantly, uh, she's a working mom uh, to three young children, Sienna, Sage, and Sloan, and they like to refer to them kids apparently as the uh, to themselves as the S kids, which I think they sound, they sound like a, uh, a a a band, a kids band or yes. something. Yes, <laughs> so. they are proud to all have been to start with us. And um, as I, I was reminded yesterday too, by the way, that Christina knows how to ride the unicycle, so I had to throw that. In <laughs> you there, just so. had to throw that one in there. Yeah. Um, this is true. Probably not anymore, but as a young child, I was able to do that. Uh, well, thanks, Patrick, for the lovely introduction. Um, and now I'm thrilled to share a little bit about you with our audience today. Um, so Patrick brings over 20 years of management experience across several industries. Prior to joining HBS in the role he's in now, he held various leadership roles in manufacturing businesses and served as a captain in a U.S. Air Force intelligence organization. Patrick also has a BS in mathematics from the University of Notre Dame and an MS in project and systems management from Golden Gate University, and finally an MBA from Harvard Business School. Um, and we're so thrilled that he has decided to come back and be our executive director of HBS Online and Executive Education. Um, so with that, we will now move on to sharing tips to help you advance your career, which is what we're here to do today. Uh, so to kick things off, I'm going to start with a few questions for Patrick, and then we hope to answer some questions from the audience if there's time, and you can feel free to submit questions via the Zoom Q&A or through our Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube channels. All right, so to kick things off, um, Patrick, the first question I have for you is, um, I think, you know, in the news, in the headlines every day, we are hearing about workers leaving their posi positions in unprecedented numbers. So what do you think is driving what is being called this great resignation? Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I, um, I, th I th thought a lot about this one. I've read a lot about it. And it's interesting to me that nobody really seems to have a definitive answer. It really is a bit perplexing. I think there's certainly uh, some drivers we can point to and some other uh, aspects of, of our economy right now that are helping sustain kind of a uh, this pattern of churn in the marketplace. Um, the most obvious one, I think, is COVID. I mean, something fundamentally did change when people were forced to rethink the way that they work. And I think that while a lot of what you read about with respect to people leaving uh, one job for another has to do with trying to move into a position where there's more flexibility, it's hard for me to believe that explains everything. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there's partly also a psychological effect to it. I think people felt like uh, the world had uh, has gotten more uncertain and that um, if you don't have uh, you know complete nirvana at your current role, you might as well uh, try somewhere else. Um, and the other thing is that um, in a, in a kind of unanticipated way, the during COVID and coming out of it, despite what the stock market's doing, the underlying economy seems to have some uh, some you know fire in it, and so there's a lot of growing businesses out there that have a lot of a lot of demand. 
Um, and even if we had people return to the workforce in larger numbers, there still would probably be an excess of jobs over um, jobs available over labor to fill those jobs. Now, uh, as I as I know people in HBS online have heard me say, I do think that uh, it can be dangerous to assume that lasts forever because it never does. And to the extent that we enter a recession that includes a significant tightening of the labor market, I think that the great resignation will stop pretty abruptly. It's easy to resign from a job if you think there's a better deal right around the corner. Not so easy if you're worried about finding your next gig. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and just to put an interesting stat to all this, so um, I was reading this paper from McKinsey that they put out in July on this great attrition, um, and they noted that they have, I've never heard of this stat, the voluntary quit rate. So people just, you know, leaving their job because that's what they decide to do is up 25% from pre-pandemic levels. And they actually don't expect that to return to normal levels for some time now. And they actually put the onus of this more on employers um, and the way that they put job descriptions out there targeting what they're viewing as workers who are traditionalists and very focused solely on compensation and titles and advancement opportunities. But like you said, um, things have really changed for folks um, and people have really evaluated not just what they're looking for in their jobs, but in their lives. Um, so employers really need to think about, too, the, the value proposition they're putting out there and how they can adjust what are the benefits that people are looking for, because it's it's more like flexibility and mental and behavioral health benefits and strong company culture. So um, there's some responsibility on the employers as well to help narrow this gap. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, and I, uh, but I, I also think that we felt like we do, feel like we're doing a point counterpoint here, <laughs> um, um, where, uh, again, I think the underlying economy will drive a lot of what that behavior looks like, because employers will feel less, uh, it will feel less necessary to, to do more things that are quote unquote, employee friendly, if there's 10 applicants for every job. On the flip side of that, if you're um, one applicant for every 10 jobs is a, is an employee seeking a job, then you hold a lot more cards. And I think right now we haven't reached an equilibrium there, but, yeah. but no matter what, I do think I agree that it's going to be different than it was, you know, pre pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but the economy drives a lot of this as well. Uh, for sure. Um, all right. So moving on to a different topic. So um, it's it, we're also hearing a lot about how some organizations have begun loosening degree requirements and hiring based on more on skills now. So what opportunities do you think this presents? And is the college education a thing of the past? <laughs> Well, I don't think the college education is a thing of the past. The, the way the format of the college education and what's included in a college education may be. There's more and more pressure on higher education institutions, I think, to provide uh, an education at a reasonable cost that allows people, particularly if they borrow money to get the degree, to be able to pay off that degree in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do, and we could have a whole webinar on that. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go uh, too down that path. But there's a it's not an either or world. I mean, there's a world for both. There's a world for people who all they'll ever do is get a get a traditional undergraduate four year degree, at least in the United States, and then go work somewhere. There's a market for people who will never get a college degree and will get just it will have on their resume, uh, you know, uh, courses like what we offered HPS online, some discrete, shorter courses uh, that allow you to learn a skill uh, that you can put uh, to work literally the next day. You don't have to wait to go through four years of education, studying things you may never use, uh, and then go through a job search process and so forth. It allows you to stay in your job and use uh, and use skills you, you already have. Um, I still think that, um, and again, this comes back to labor market, when there's not very much labor out there um, and there's a lot of jobs, employers are going to be much more flexible when it comes to what they'll tolerate, for lack of a better word, when it comes to your education. I do think uh, this is an area, again, to be careful, though, you can't anticipate that employers will continue to loosen requirements for a given job um, if they then have more power with respect to who they hire. But I do think that if you're a, a, a somebody looking for a job or, or looking to change careers, that, um, that it probably is more important now than it ever has been to show skills versus, uh, I don't know how else to say this, but versus just a, a shield or a degree just to say you did it. You need to show that what you did gave you um, gave you tools in your toolkit that allow you to help your employer 
um, and uh, the group you work in perform better, deliver better financial returns, and so forth. So yes, I think I think there's more of a role now for what I what I heard somebody once call um, just in time learning, which is like the courses HBS Online and other online providers offer, where you can learn a discrete skill, and just in case learning, which is a traditional um, uh, bachelor's degree, where, for example, I took philosophy and theology, but I don't use that regularly in my life, at least not directly. Uh, you probably did too, having gone to a Catholic university as well. Um, so yes, I, I think there's room for both and it's not either or, um, and, and people should worry about skills. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think something else that's really interesting about this too, is, um, the diversity component of all of this. So if you look at some of the data, uh, only 26% of African-Americans and 19% of Hispanics age 25 and older hold bachelor's or post-grad degrees compared to 40% of non-Hispanic whites and about 60% of Asian Americans. So I think um, with a focus and attention on skills at the moment with the current labor shortages, it, it can really help reduce inequality by creating a more diverse workforce um, and, and bring out these workers that have often been hidden from employment opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In fact, and it brings up another great point uh, that I didn't mention last time is that we often think of, of uh, education being very linear. Like you go to high school, mm -hmm. then you get a four-year college degree, then maybe you get a master's degree, and maybe you take a few online courses to brush up on something you've either forgotten about or never knew. It doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, in the, in the world you're talking about, in a world where we're trying to get more diversity into businesses and universities, there's no reason that somebody can't start with the skills training Mm -hmm. And then move later to the um, to the the degreed uh, sort of programs, or or never do it. I mean, obviously there are opportunities to do some really interesting things without having a degree if you've got the right training. So I think you're absolutely right. It's a great opportunity to kind of move the needle in areas where it's been hard to for a long time. Yeah. So and and building upon this, so when it comes to building your business skills, what are what are some creative ways people can do that um, apart from you know just getting a degree? Yeah, I, there's a lot. Often, there's a lot of things you can do that people think of as a side hustle. So, if you decide you really want to learn about, uh, let's say you're working as uh, as an accountant, but your passion is to be a vet and you want to change careers, <laughs> this is a little bit of an extreme example. Um, you know, there's probably an opportunity to go work part time, probably for not very much pay, but in a uh, in a veterinary office and learn what it's like to to be uh, a veterinarian. You certainly will A, learn whether you like it, and B, have a sense of what it really means to do the job day to day. Because often I think people, um, and I know I've done this certainly when I was younger, you can romanticize what a job will be like. And then you realize when you really look under the hood, you're, mm, I don't know if I want to you know, deal, uh, deal with that. Uh, along the same lines, uh, just any volunteer work that exposes you to um, other careers or excuse me, other industries and also, and maybe more importantly, because volunteer organizations draw people from all sorts of industries, it's a great way to build a network that you otherwise wouldn't have, but it's building a network around a common interest other than the career field, right? So in other words, let's say you like to do things in the area of, you know, helping raise money for MS, research in MS. There's going to be people from all walks of life in all sorts of industries at all levels in an industry that are going to be part of whatever organization you're going to engage with. And it gives you an opportunity to learn from them, not just about what you're doing in the nonprofit, but what they're doing uh, in their work lives. Uh, and that gets to the just more general advice of expanding your network. I think it's important to, uh, to be you know, talking to people all the time. And by the way, don't, don't expand it when you need it. That doesn't work. First of all, it seems, it seems disingenuous. People are going to know you're looking for help because you need it right now. Uh, and secondly, it's hard to build a big network in a week. So it's always better to kind of have uh, have connected with people throughout your career, um, even if you don't think you'll ever need them in in, in, the, in the realm of getting you a job or helping you uh, advance in some way. So do it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I throw one more idea in the mix that's a little more non-traditional? Um take an improv class. I think there's so much you can learn from improv um, in terms of business skills, like how to think on your feet, how to react to new situations, being a good listener, um, the idea of not fearing failure. Uh, so you've, you've got to be willing to step outside your comfort zone to take that on. But I, I do think that is a great way to, to prepare and build some skills that are directly related to, to business. I have never done that. So I, I might have to someday. 
we could make it a work event. We should, yeah, we should do it. A, we should make it an HBS online executive education uh, corporate retreat where we all go to a improv camp or something. I would love to see that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so moving on, I know you were, we, we already have touched a little bit on the ability to take um, some online courses. So how relevant is online training in your mind versus in-person learning? Um, well, yeah, that's an interesting question because it can be answered from so many angles. Uh, it certainly is, there's no doubt it's relevant given the explosion in online learning, particularly over the last three or four years. So uh, if, if relevance means it's present and influencing how people think about education, then it's absolutely uh, relevant. Um, often that question gets parlayed into another one. I think we might have had a question in the, in the uh, pre-submitted questions that was along this is whether people value, uh, employers value online education of all sorts um, in a way differently than they value the in-person education. Um, I, I think the answer to that honestly was yes. I'm not sure though that that's being maintained. And I always make this case is that, you know, hiring managers right now, if you, if you assume that um, the, in, if you look at a bell curve of the age of people who are doing hiring, the kind of meaty middle is probably people, let's say in their 30, 30 years old, to 40 years old, I'm just making up a number. Many of those people, if you kind of work backwards, did not uh, probably take a lot of online programming when they were uh, getting their education. And so I think if that's true, and this isn't true of everybody, but but there may be a bias there saying, well, if somebody didn't do what you did, then it's not as good. So I think that uh, many years ago, it was a lot harder uh, row to hoe, so to speak, for people who studied online. Now, though, there are more and more hiring managers who have been educated through at least partially through online education. And and obviously, they probably are not going to devalue what they did. And when you don't devalue what you did, you don't devalue the same thing in other people. And so when they're going to hire, I think as time progresses, we're going to see more and more acceptance of online programs, whether that be a degree or or a discrete um, online course, a skills course. It's gonna it's gonna be something that's not considered unusual at all. In fact, you probably will look like you have three heads if you haven't done that at some point in your career. So I think that it's absolutely relevant. It's become more and more relevant as time passes. Absolutely. Um, we recently did a study that um, to, for our specific programs to understand the impact that our online offerings are having. Did you want to share some of those results with yeah. our audience? Yeah, and by the way, I, I want to say something that's interesting here. We, you know, we we hire a research firm that helps us do these things, and mm -hmm. when we met with the researcher to explain the results, um, you know, obviously we're hoping we see really great results out of these things. And uh, and he mentioned that you know they're a pretty serious research firm, and he wanted to make sure that um, when they do things like this, they're not telling us what we want to hear; that they're actually finding real data. And he made the comment that he was shocked at how compelling the data was himself. So that was really great, uh, really great to hear. But we talked to, or they talked to, 2,000 um, past participants of HBS online courses, and there were there were four things that really kind of stood out. Um, one was that 91% of uh, past participants uh, said that taking a course had a positive impact. An HBS online course had a positive impact on their career, and 42%, and this is where the kind of rubber meets the road, saw an increase in salary of an average of about $17,000, so about 10 times the return if, uh, of the cost of a course, if you will. 16% uh, said they received a bonus and the average increase there was 14, the average bonus rather was $14,000. And if you kind of take all these numbers and extrapolate them into our global audience, uh, you know, and I'm kind of proud of this, we could, we could claim that we cre helped create nearly $700 million in value based on the number of people who've taken one of our programs. So, um, you know, we have a mission to educate leaders that make a difference in the world. And I feel good that I think we're doing that. And, and the financial stuff, um, you can do that without financial results, but the financial results show you that um, that good leadership can have economic rewards. And to the extent that that helps people um, increase their standard of living, be able to send their own children to college, all those sorts of things, it really does have a nice flywheel effect uh, in, in making uh, the world a better place, I hope. So yes, it was very, very encouraging to see all of that data. Uh, yes, and, we, and we'll plan to share some of that data as well on our website if people have follow-up questions. Um, so, so moving more towards the importance of specific skills, which, which kind of skills do you think are the most important to have for both today and in the future? I think that, uh, you know, when you ask employers what they want from employees, there are a few things that come up pretty frequently. And number one, at least, and I know it's high on my list, is you have to have the ability to work with other people. 
And that, and to do that, you need a number of skills. One is um, you need to be a good follower. You also need to be a good leader. So studying leadership, I think is pretty important and studying it and practicing it. You can't, it, you know, I would argue you can't just read a book or take a course and be the best leader ever, but the combination of taking a course on leadership or reading a book on leadership and then putting into practice things at work uh, or in your personal life for that matter, uh, can be um, you know very very helpful. I would argue in business that any type of analytic skill is going to be helpful, and I don't mean you have to be a data scientist or anything like that. I'm just talking about being able to uh, to do what I call the kind of scientific method of thinking. It's the if then else, right? Do you have a hypothesis? Um, if so, why do you think it's true? And then if you gather data, or you run an experiment, and that tells you something different, then how do you adjust your hypothesis? What did you get wrong? Being able to do that in any job is so critical. It's fundamentally uh, the reason humans are hired into jobs at all, and we don't have robots running the world, is that we bring a level of intuition and um, and reason that is very hard to program into something. Although I'm sure a lot of computer scientists out there would tell me we're on the verge of that. Um, so really, it really becoming good in the in in thinking analytically and in leading, I think, are very uh, very very important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and with that whole thinking ana, ana, analytically, I think the other soft skill, if you will, that's really important yeah. that comes with that is is communication. So being yes. able to do some analysis, but also how do you share that out um, with folks across your organization in a way that they understand it and it's compelling. Um, so communication, I would put up there as well as another really important skill. Yeah. And by the way, to that point, I remember as an HBS uh, student, as an MBA student many years ago, and you went through this too, you know, we're, we're told to told to join study groups. So we formed these study mm -hmm. groups where we meet with, you know, six or seven of our peers and study the cases every morning. And, and we divide up the work. If there was analysis that had to be done, somebody would do one piece of analysis. I do another piece of analysis. And I remember saying to a faculty member back then, there was a really weird way to learn because in any other context, it would be considered cheating, right? Because you're getting right. together with your, your peers and you're sharing information about how to solve a problem. But when you think about it, that's the way it really works in the real world. You're not doing it typically by yourself. And uh, this faculty member mentioned to me something you just alluded to, which that most of your job uh, as you move up in an organization, you get increasing increased management responsibility is to collect information from people who work with and for you and then assimilate that information into an argument or a case that then you need to make to somebody else, right? So you do some research. You've done this for me. You do some market research and then you hand it to me and I go and talk to our dean and say, I think we should do this. And you obviously have done that with the dean as well. Um, and having the skill to communicate, especially information you didn't gather, um, is, I think, very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. We have a couple more questions that were pre-submitted from our audience, and then we can open it up to see if there's any um, additional questions folks would like to submit while we're live. Um, so... The next one is, how do you approach career change when considering a person's age and career level? I don't think, frankly, the approach really changes. I mean, I, I know um, we had a number of questions from people who were, I'll say, of a certain age because I'm that age, but let's say 50 and over. And um, and there there's a sense that, that I think is valid in some cases. I mean, I won't, I'm not going to deny that if you're, um, you know, in getting your 50s and 60s, especially if you've been in the same career for a long time, trying to make a transition to something else can be very difficult. But ultimately, the tools to get there are the same. It's the networking. It's the skills enhancement. It's, you know, it, it's being comfortable and good at going into an interview and making a case as to why this gets that analytical thinking, by the way, making a case as to why, yes, you didn't do this job exactly, but you've done other things where the skills you learned and you've honed over many years really do help get this new job done. And then to play up your experience. I mean, there, there's no doubt, um, and, and you know, those of us who have had a few jobs and lived for a while, look back and you do, you do learn a lot through osmosis and just living life. You, you, you've had more experiences and you've gotten better at things over time. And so I think emphasizing that is critical when you have more experience versus less experience. I'll say it that mm -hmm. way versus older and younger. Um, so I think the, the basic uh, activities are the same. The intensity with which you have to do them and the order in which you do them may vary a little bit, but mm -hmm. they, they don't change very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right. This next question maybe is a little bit more relevant to me, but uh, yeah. we'll see what you think. So how does a stay at home <laughs> mom looking to re-enter the workforce, recalibrate and reinvent herself creative, creatively? Um so if you'd like, I can I can provide a little bit of insight on this one to kick things off. So I have never um, been a stay-at-home mother, so yes, I will. 
Um, so I've done this three times in terms of returning to work after having a child. And um, I would say the first time I did it, I was very stressed out and had high anxiety. The second time I had a little bit less anxiety. And then the third time I was almost celebrating. Um, so <laughs> while I love my three children so much. Um, you know, I also like being in a quiet place where I can think and drink a cup of coffee and have adult conversations and use my brain in a different way. So for me personally, working and having a job to go to during the day gives me a balance and a sense of accomplishment, which I think ultimately makes me happy and a better mom. But back to the question, though, because I think the question might have been referring to people who are out for several years, um, you know, not just a standard maternity leave. So how do you get back in the game? So that's more of the scenario where you don't necessarily have a job at an organization waiting for you after you have a child. Um, so you need to go out and get it. Um, and I read about the most fascinating thing that companies in this labor shortage are doing right now um, to win back parents who want to re-enter the workforce. And it's this concept called a returnship. So we all know what an internship is, um, but a returnship is actually targeted to mid-career professionals who've taken a career break of usually two years. And um, it's two to six months typically, and it has the potential to convert into a permanent position. Um, but it's it's a way to make sure that whatever you want to dip your toe into and get and as you're getting back into the game, it's the right fit for both the organization, but for you. Um, and if for some reason it's not something that you're interested in, I mean, it still gives you the opportunity to refresh your skills and your resume a bit. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity for people to explore. Um, and some big companies are, are launching these returnships like Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, IBM. Um, there's also another great organization I'd point people to, uh, which is called iRelaunch. Um, and it's a resource for career rebooters, and it can help you with career advice. They have a job board, and it's specifically for people who have been out of the workforce for a couple of years. Um, and they also have an annual back-to-work conference that looks really interesting and an ability to network and make some great connections. Um, and then finally, I think the last thing I'll say, which I've had a lot of success with as well, is um, both at Harvard Business School, but also at my college, um, the career centers now offer career coaching for alumni at any stage of life. So not just for current students, um, and a lot of schools will offer a few sessions that are advisory for free, and um, they also invite some of their past graduates to their job fairs. Um, so that would be another interesting thing for folks to look at for opportunities um, to explore new roles. You said it all better than I could have. <laughs> Uh, the good news is, you know, getting back to where we started is that there's plenty of opportunity out, out there right now. So, yes. um, you know, it, it, of course, finding a place is one thing and then, I, and then being ready to come back into the workforce and to enjoy where you are and so forth is, is critical, but um, there shouldn't be a shortage of opportunities. Yeah. All right, so it looks like we have a couple of questions that have been submitted. Um, so there's one from Alex who's with us on Zoom. And his question is, is there room for business generalists in the world of business today? Yeah, I'm looking at the same one, actually. I thought that oh, was- okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, um, so this one's near and dear to my heart is uh, if, it, the answer absolutely is yes. Um, usually though, the way a career works is you're a specialist before you become a generalist. So I do think there's, the, Usually, and one exception I'll give is the one I, I was my life, which is the military. The military tends to, in the United States anyway, tends to give you a lot of responsibility uh, early and you kind of have to be a generalist. But most people are going to have a career where they're going to need to focus on a discipline. And as they get good at that discipline, it opens up other, other opportunities to move into higher and higher levels in the org, managing teams in that discipline and then managing multiple teams across many disciplines and so forth. Um, the the business generalist role is one that I would, you know, call a, a, a general manager. The idea that you don't have a specific skill set that you're employing every single day, but that doesn't mean you're not employing skill sets, obviously. And in fact, the ones you will employ, Christina alluded to earlier, it's going to be more and more of the soft skills than it is going to be the uh, the harder skills, if you will. Although, you know, frankly, you're going to use all of those as well. But um, again, I'll bring it back to myself. One thing I find weird about being a business generalist, and I think I've said this in front of Christina before, is, it, is that, you know, um, yesterday I was at work at 6.30 in the morning and I got home at 9. That's, that's actually a little, little unusual um, for, for my job. Um, 
But I look back on it and I think to myself, what did I really do? Because it's not like I have a, a work product output on most days, but I did when I was younger because I was having to generate a report or a presentation or something like that. Most of my job entails, um, you know, how we think about our organization strategically, worrying a lot about the HR stuff, getting out and talking to people, make sure everybody understands what I think our vision is and the direction we should all be moving, all of those sorts of things. We had an all staff meeting yesterday uh, that Christina was at and, um, you know, getting ready for that. Uh, those things to me are so important. And that's part of what being a business journalist ultimately leads to. But you got to have the more the more um, focused skills use early in your career, typically. Mm -hmm. And I think, Christina, please act. you've been down the same path before. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think being able um, to move around earlier on in more specific functions like finance, marketing, um, operations, and, and building those specialized skills first before getting into a broader, more generalist management role makes a lot of sense um, and kind of puts together the pieces for you before you're looking at the whole big picture. So yeah, yeah. I, would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, all right, so we have another question from Rachel on Zoom. So what advice do you have for someone looking to switch industries or I guess switch careers after a few years of working? So one example she gave was going from nonprofit to tech. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always hard to know when uh, because there's there's so many ways you could be involved in, in tech. Um, the first thing I'd say is there's obviously a ton of nonprofits that are knee deep in tech. And so maybe maybe there's a secondary transition where you get involved in a hot, if you aren't already and you may be, I don't know, I have enough information here. But if you're not involved in tech at all, your current nonprofit role is to maybe find a way inside your nonprofit to um, to do uh, more technical uh, tasks. And if not, then maybe switch nonprofits, and do technical tasks there and then transition completely out and do a more pure, quote unquote, uh, tech job. But um, in the end, I think that uh, the key is always going to be making sure you can de demonstrate the skills or learn them while you are using skills you already have. So uh, here's a case where I would say that looking to get additional education in an area where you may not have the skills is pretty important. Um, there's one other thing I was going to mention that uh, skills tech. Yeah, I'm losing my train of thought. So I'll turn it back to you, Christina. But that, that, would, be, um, that would be my advice. Yeah, no, that, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, this next question is an interesting one from Elton on Zoom. So how oh, do I prop oh wait, I'm sorry, I remember yeah. what I was gonna say. Good, I was good. Gonna say, yes, because I, I wrote this. So I write this uh recently, I've started writing this column for Forbes, and I recently wrote an article about questions to ask yourself when you want to get an MBA. I will say, getting back to Rachel's question, it, it a, a career transition for whatever reason, I'm not sure I understand all the reasons for this, but it's definitely true is if you go and get a full-time MBA, a full, if you go to a full-time program and get an MBA, it typically does allow you to make a break from your past. Christina did this. I did this. We got our MBAs. You kind of make a break from your past, whatever career you went before, and you come out a new and different person on the other side that makes it easier sometimes to transition. Now, you know, let's be honest, that's an expensive and a way to do it, and it can take some time, but it does seem to have uh, give you more flexibility with changing careers. So that's always something you might want to consider as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Christina. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. That was a good um, point to add on when you remembered it. Um, so the next question is, how do I properly manage people who are older than me? Um, so uh, I actually have a lot of experience with this. Not now, because I feel like everybody <laughs> the worst thing is, young, is younger. But um, uh, I, going back to my military career, that's another thing that's very unusual is that I was a 22 year old officer in the military and put in charge of a team of about 30 people, many of whom were older than I am now. And that, that can be very, very tricky. Um, so what I, th there's a few things I tell the people. One is, is recognize that no matter what, they could be jerks, um, they could be incompetent in some areas, they could be brilliant. But they're always going to know more than you know. If they've been there in, in the job longer than you, uh, they'll know more about that job. And again, getting back to what I said earlier, they're going to know more li about life in general. So uh, right off of the bat, I think it's important to position yourself in a way that shows that you understand that and that you don't mm -hmm. think that you're the smartest person in the room and that you're going to draw on their skills. It's absolutely critical. Now, that doesn't mean that over time, and in fact, in my role in the Air Force, there was a gentleman who I treated that way, like he, he was very smart, great guy. Uh, and then one day in front of everybody uh, during a kind of a critical mission, he challenged me openly um, and I was not pleased. And it was the hardest thing I had to do, but I pulled him into my office and I told him that he could come and disagree with me any, mm -hmm. as much as he wants. He can yell at me, he can call me names, but he can't do it in front of other people. I said, I'll, I'll give him that courtesy and he needs to give me that courtesy. 
And you know what, after that, that guy and I, we were like uh, peas in a pod, we were like best buddies. So, um, so I think you need to do the first thing, you know, mm -hmm. show humility, know that you can learn uh, from those who are older than you. Um, but then don't be shy about in, in appropriate context, establishing yourself as the boss, because it's not good for anybody if you don't do that. So that'd be my advice there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a helpful balance to remember and, and try to get right. Um, all right. So the next question is from Zanye on also on Zoom. Uh, the Zoom crowd really is asking a lot of questions here. <laughs> so what is your advice for negotiating an internship or contract job into a full time permanent position? Uh, yeah, another good one that I don't have an easy answer for. I, I, you know, the most important thing about getting a job, I'll state the obvious first, is to make sure whatever you're doing, you're doing very, very well, even when it doesn't seem like it counts, because you're not going to have a shot if people think that you're not dedicated and doing uh, doing very well for them. So that's number one. And I'm assuming that uh, that you've done that. The person who's asking has done that. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the second thing is to... Uh, a, make sure that you're communicating to uh, those you're working with in a contract basis that you're interested in, in a full-time role. And B, not waiting for them to tell you when opportunities present themselves. Often you may see an opportunity that they don't even know they, that they or you may see a need they don't even know they have. And talking to them about meeting that need in a full-time way can give you the opportunity to, uh, to get on full-time. And then Christina, I don't know if you had experience with this, but because um, you know, I can think of it way back early in my career, but mm -hmm. it's so long ago, I don't remember the details of how I might have done it. But have you ever had to face a question like that? Um, I have. And I think one thing that um, I've always tried to do, especially in an internship scenario, is to get out and grab coffee and network with people in other parts of the organization, because you never know when they're going to have a hiring need. And at the end of an internship, maybe your group might not have space for another full-time employee, but maybe there are open roles um, in other areas of the organization. If you've spent that time getting out there and meeting folks, um, that that always puts you in a better position because when you already have experience inside the walls of the company um, and you've met some folks and colleagues uh, informally, and that that puts you in a better spot when you start to formally interview for those types of positions. Yeah, you know, it's a, a really, really great point. Uh, I just want to put a, put a button on that one because I, you know, I think often, particularly people yet early in their careers, don't have an appreciation for as hiring managers, the thing you don't want to do is spend a ton of time bringing somebody on board and then realize you made a mistake. And that's always a risk when you're going outside your organization and hiring somebody who's never done anything for you. Uh, in fact, even if they have glowing references, because I think I've been burned by this many, many times before, but, but there's no denying if you are very good in whatever you're doing, say within one division of a company as a part-time employee, that people speaking well of you and you meeting people in other parts, divisions of that company is, is a much lower risk way for them to hire. And I'd argue they'd even be more willing to take a chance on you if your skills aren't perfectly aligned with the need than go outside and try and somebody who might look perfectly aligned on paper, but they don't have any idea of whether they'll fit in the culture, whether they'll work well as a team member and so forth. So that's great advice. Um, and I think we've got one more question here from Carlos on Zoom. So if I'm an experienced professional, but I don't have a master's degree, how would you recommend I overcome this in the short term? Well, I think the first question I would have, and I know we can't answer it here, is is why do you need to overcome anything? It's uh, I, I don't know enough here to know why the master's degree is critical. There are certainly plenty of people who um, who do you know great things in business and have very fulfilling careers without having gotten a master's degree. If you um, if you do think it's necessary, and actually, what was the what? How remind me how the question was phrased, Christina? Yeah, if I'm an experienced professional, um, so some years right. of work experience there, but I don't have a master's degree, how would you recommend I overcome this in the short term? Well, uh, okay, so let me let me make an assumption. I'm assuming that this person works in an organization where those who have gotten the promotion that you have your eyes on have master's degrees. So first thing I would do is make sure that that's necessary. It could be a coincidence, although I'm going to assume that this this work has been done. Um, and if that's and if that's the case, and you don't want to go get a master's degree yourself, then it comes back to what you said before. What what the questioner asked about was making sure you're highlighting your experience and demonstrating every day the value you bring that's equal to or better than those who have a master's degree. If ultimately um, you, you still have the sense that a master's degree is necessary, then I would spend a lot of the time understanding from your employer, if again, you're trying to stay in the same company, 
what are the skills they look for? The degree, is, you know, presumably is a is a means to get a skill. And while other people may have gotten a master's degree to get that skill, maybe they would be um, okay uh, with you gaining skills through having taken. Let me make an example: HBS online courses. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. Um, but th there are, there are ways to get education, as we talked about earlier, without getting a master's degree. And maybe that's what you should focus on, or what are the skills I need, not the degree I need. Yeah, that that that's a great point and kind of ties back to what we were talking about before with, you know, all this degree inflation at the, at the moment and, and yeah. being able to tie back your skills to whatever the job requires. Um, all right. Well, I we are running short on time, so I think we're going to wrap things up now. Um, we've covered today a number of cost effective ways to ensure your financial well-being and your career advancement. Um, and I just wanted to thank Patrick for sharing your insights and ideas and thank everybody with us online for joining. And we look forward to seeing you at another webinar in the future. And thanks for sharing yours as well. <laughs> no problem. Christina. <laughs> Bye, everybody.